I'm going to make you sad now. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first set foot on the moon on July 20th, 1969. And if you do a little quick math, we're nearly at the 48 year anniversary of that amazing event. The last person to set foot on the moon was Eugene Cernan, who climbed up the ladder into the lunar module on December 14th, 1972, a few months until the 45th anniversary of that occasion. Since then, all human missions have been to low Earth orbit. We've explored every square meter of that nothingness at an altitude of about 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, both with the Space Shuttle and now with the International Space Station, which has been continuously inhabited since November 2000. The Chinese have set up their own independent space program and also sent humans into low Earth orbit, but so far, nobody's gone deeper. Over the course of the nearly last half century, there have been multiple plans to send humans farther and deeper out into space. And let me provide you with some examples. NASA originally had a series of missions planned after they wrapped up Apollo 17. There would be more missions to the moon, a lunar base, and maybe even crewed missions to Venus. But those were scrapped, and the Skylab space station was the final mission using the Apollo hardware. NASA then worked on the Space Shuttle, which provided human exploration of space from 1981 to 2011. The shuttle was never really designed to go any further than low Earth orbit. It proved that space is a place that we can regularly visit for almost three decades, but also showed how dangerous that journey still is with the Challenger and the Columbia disasters. In 1989, the first President Bush announced a bold new plan to explore the solar system called the Space Exploration Initiative. And this would include sending a huge mission to Mars, costing $500 billion over 20 to 30 years. This initiative was canceled by President Clinton in 1992 and replaced with the Cheaper, Faster, Better, maintaining the existing shuttle and space station program and developing lower cost robotic missions to achieve quick wins in space exploration. In 2004, the next President Bush announced that NASA was going to be going back to the moon and then on to Mars with the Constellation program. First, they finished the ISS, then they'd send humans out beyond the orbit of the moon by 2008 and put humans back on the surface of the moon by 2020. In 2010, President Obama announced that there would be a human Mars mission in the 2030s, but first, we'd be sending humans to an asteroid by 2025. And he also officially terminated the Constellation program in 2011. And now, here we are in 2017 with the Orion capsule and the Space Launch System in development thanks to the expertise of the folks who worked on the Space Shuttle. It's a combination of the tried and true capsule format matched with a monster rocket more powerful than anything that's come before it. And if everything goes as planned, the first launch of Orion will happen in 2019, but without any crew. A further crewed launch will come after that, probably. But as we've seen already, plans can change. The political party in power can have different priorities and the long-term objectives can head in a totally new direction. As I'm recording this video, we literally have no idea what NASA is planning to do next. Continue on to Mars, return to the moon, visit an asteroid, everything is up in the air as President Trump decides on a long-term objective. As you've seen in the previous administrations, even if he does decide on a bold new target, it'll most likely get canceled based on the next administration's priorities. It'll be deja vu all over again. So how can we get off this cycle? In 2012, a group from NASA proposed a completely different style of human space exploration known as a capabilities-driven approach. Their document was called Voyages, charting the course for sustainable human space exploration. And it was fantastic, in my opinion. It works like this. Since we know that the U.S. space exploration program is dependent on the long-term priorities of whatever party's in power, and we know that the parties have a tendency to cancel the programs of the previous administration, NASA should undertake a program that can handle this constant change of administration. Instead of planning a long-term, all-or-nothing approach, they can restructure NASA so that every part of their human space exploration efforts is to increase the capability of their space exploration efforts. Now, let me give an example. The Apollo missions were developed with a very specific goal in mind, putting humans on the surface of the moon and returning them safely to Earth. 
the configuration and capabilities of the super heavy lift Saturn V, the command module, the lunar module, were all developed with this specific objective in mind, and it worked. That said, it might not have worked if the US wasn't in a race for space with the Soviet Union. But once Apollo 17 was over, the entire program was scrapped. Those amazing Saturn V rockets were used for other missions or dismantled, and as you know, we never went back. So I'd like you to think about a different part of NASA's history where a capabilities driven approach was incredibly effective, the Gemini program. These were the missions that came before Apollo. They had no other purpose but to learn how to use space better and for longer periods. Its objective was to learn how to keep humans alive in space for longer and how to perform the various orbital docking maneuvers that would be required for future missions. The first human Gemini mission's goal was only three orbits of the Earth. After that, they added a 22 minute spacewalk, then a week long flight with 120 orbits, then a space rendezvous with another spacecraft. By the end of the program, Buzz Aldrin completed a record setting 5 hour and 30 minute spacewalk. With each mission, NASA learned a little more about what it takes to keep humans alive in space and how to perform the kinds of maneuvers needed to push on beyond mere low Earth orbit. In a moment, I'm going to talk about the specific kinds of capabilities NASA should focus on, but first I'd like to thank Simon Rouse, Christian McCracken, Jason Rubsom, and the rest of our 755 patrons for their generous support. If you love what we're doing and you want to get in on the action, head over to patreon.com slash universe today. The NASA report identified four different regions of the solar system that we should become capable of reaching. Cislunar space and the Earth-Moon Lagrange points, near-Earth asteroids, Earth's moon, and finally Mars and its moons. Cislunar space is the region outside the Earth's atmosphere, including the Earth-Moon Lagrange points, which are just past the orbit of the Moon. This region is outside the Earth's protective magnetosphere, so NASA will need to develop hardware that can allow astronauts to survive the radiation environment of space. There are many different orbits and positions in this region that already have satellites that could be serviced. Beyond the Moon is a radio silent region that might make a great spot for a powerful radio telescope. This region is close to Earth, so if there are problems, we can quickly send rescue missions and resupplies, but it's also incredibly dangerous, testing our explorers and their technology to the limit. We'll learn a tremendous amount, but still be close to home. NASA will need to develop the technologies of beyond Earth orbit crew and cargo access, as well as in space propulsion. The next capability is to the near Earth asteroids. These are much further away than the lunar orbit, but their orbits are very similar to Earth. And what this means is that a journey takes longer, but it doesn't require significantly more powerful rockets. By visiting these asteroids, we'll learn more about the Earth's origins and the origin of life on Earth. We'll learn to access the kinds of space-based metals and organic material that we'll need for a future solar system civilization. Finally, one of these asteroids will eventually smash into Earth, so it makes sense to learn more about these threats and how we might be able to redirect them. In order to carry out these operations, NASA will need to develop long-duration space habitation to keep astronauts alive in space for long periods of time. We'll need more flexible propulsion systems in human habitats, and NASA will also need to develop new ways that humans and robotic explorers can work together. From there, the report suggests we return to the Moon, this time to stay. By visiting the Moon, we'll learn more about the history of the Earth-Moon system and learn to survive by living off the land. The Moon has resources we can use, like the lunar regolith, deposits of water, and even lava tubes which we could pressurize and live inside. In addition, the advances in long-duration spaceflight and propulsion systems, NASA will need to develop new surface technologies for moving around, exploring, and harvesting resources from other worlds. And all this builds up to the great goal of going to Mars. The Red Planet is a long way away, and there are many challenges in order to be able to travel to and survive there. And because of the way the orbits work out, you can either visit Mars for 30 days or 500 days. That long away from Earth without any quick rescue will take a crew and hardware that have been tested many times in many different scenarios. And once we can go to Mars, explore, survive, and return, we'll be ready to go almost anywhere else in the solar system that we put our minds to. I can appreciate why politicians like to state a goal for human space exploration. Going to the Moon, an asteroid, or Mars is exciting. But as we've seen, the most likely outcome is that administrations change, plans change, and you're stuck spending almost 50 years going around 
and around the Earth. The capabilities driven approach provides no audacious goal, just a slow and steady accumulation of hardware and knowledge that will eventually make us capable of going anywhere we want. I don't know about you, but I want us to go everywhere. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think a capabilities driven approach makes sense? What do you think is the best way to explore the solar system? In our next episode, I help you get ready for the great American eclipse. I'll talk about what dark and terrible gods from beyond our universe have destroyed the sun and what terrible sacrifices they'll need us to make so they'll bring the sun back. Also, how to watch it safely without hurting your eyes and how to take some cool pictures. That's next time. For this episode's playlist, I just want to inspire you with really interesting talks about what's possible in the realm of human and robotic space exploration. The first lecture is from Dr. Cameron Smith about interstellar travel. Planetary Resources talks about mining asteroids, how and where we should be colonizing space. The exploration and colonization of Mars and what colonizing Venus might look like. The political party in power can have drift different pro oh, can we go back?